Okay, so let's start immediately. I will give the floor to our first speaker, who is Mauro Bon Aiuti, who for more than a decade has been dealing with the uh, questions relating to uh, economy and economics. He's worked in uh, Bologna, Modena, and uh, is now uh, a lecturer at Torino University. And uh, he was one of the co-founders of the Italian Degrowth Union. He has uh, published various books on uh, bioeconomics and degrowth. He has uh, also uh, looked at the question of uh, towards another ecological uh, e economy and his future um, book is going to be called Political uh, Transition because that's what it's all about basically, major political change which uh, uh, I think uh, uh, taps into degrowth as well. So it's called the uh, transition uh, policies as well. And uh, it's going to be published in uh, Italy and um, the UK at the same time by Ruth. It's an excellent publishing house. So with no further ado, ado I would like to give the floor to Mario Bonaiuti. It's my turn. Works. OK. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, oh, uh, yes, I will speak in Italian because I know that we have an excellent translation. So, sì, um, parlerò in italiano e vi ringrazio. I'll be speaking Italian. I'd like to start by thanking you for having invited me here to Athens. I'm very happy to see that here as well you are starting to work and think about degrowth. I'll try and organize my speech in the following way. The first five minutes will focus on a brief introduction to the origins of degrowth, what we're talking about. In other words, which are the main contributions which have uh, given rise to this way of thinking. And then in the central part of my presentation, I will try very briefly to focus in on my main theme. Let's say I'll take up a little bit more time on that. And that is the link between, as you will see in the uh, subtitle, uh, between decline, or real degrowth in other words, and the project towards a degrowth society. Because I think that in Greek reality as well as we can see, change can come first and foremost from the real conditions of crisis we find ourselves in. So to conclude then at the end, very briefly, uh, I will look at the uh, project of the degrowth society. I don't think I'm going to have enough time to actually go into the uh, ins and outs of specific degrowth policies. In other words, what do we have to do? But uh, I think that that will partly be dealt with by people who take the floor after me. And I'm sure that in the course of the debate, we will have time to come back to what is a very crucial point, of course, as well. So very quickly. I think that the degrowth movement came into being by the convergence of two main thrusts. The order is quite by chance, but the first is bioeconomic theory from Nicolas Ceausescu Rogan. Georgescu developed his ideas largely uh, in the uh, 70s, and he was uh, very critical, radically critical of the growth economy, which, as you probably well know, is based on uh, thermo 
dynamics, the limits, mainly physical limits to growth, because uh, resources uh, run out. There is deterioration, of course, through all physical and biological processes on the one hand. And on the other, criticism of uh, development, uh, again, in the 70s, which was expressed by Ivan Illic, a small international, if you like, which uh, focused on Ivan Illic. You'll see here, I just go back here, that I picked out one of the most uh, well-known passages Giorgescu, where he couldn't be uh, clearer in his criticism here. There's absolutely no doubts about what he's saying. He's saying that, uh, you know, this is one of the most toxic issues. This was uh, in 91 that he said this, when, uh, well, the first steps uh, were being taken and uh, the first contributions were uh, published by well-known uh, reviews as well. Um, he thought that this formula, this recipe for uh, sustainable growth was really very risky, very dangerous. And in the 90s, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when the degrowth movement first came into being, bioeconomic criticism and criticism of uh, uh, development were then focused um, on this question of criticism of uh, sustainable growth development. I like coming back to Illich. It's quite clear to Illich that uh, development is not only synonymous with growth and therefore biologically in contrast with the uh, physical limits of the planet. But he was saying that uh, uh, development is, is not desirable as well. You know, he was talking uh, about this, uh, this uh, bad soup, this bad mix, if you like. And this is at the very root of uh, Latouche's work and that of others as well. Within the second point, there is uh, an issue that I would really like to highlight, and that is that uh, criticism of development is first and uh, foremost a criticism of the uh, imaginary foundations for uh, development. Cornelis Castoriadis. Uh, uh, his contribution there was crucial. Obviously, we don't have the time to go here into all the details of this very broad-ranging discussion, but there is no doubt that Serge Latouche has said on several occasions, degrowth means first and foremost uh, moving out of the uh, Imagine, imagination-based idea of development, being able to change institutions, but in order to do that, you have to change the framework within which we are uh, conducting our critical thinking about the growth society. Now, the most difficult part of my presentation comes up now because I'm trying to say in a very brief way, in a blunt way uh, as a result, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand what I'm saying and what is a very crucial aspect here, and that is that... Uh, bio-economic criticism of growth and social criticism actually meet on a, what I think is a, an essential concept, and that is the question of scale, in the sense that uh, exponential growth 
in complex systems, both biological and physical, but also social ones, necessarily involves a change in structure. A genetist, uh, Aldane, the start of the uh, century, I think, understood this similarity, if you like, between the way in which biophysical systems work on the one hand and the way in which social systems work on the other. Well, you know, I don't know, uh, never heard of uh, an elephant doing somersaults or a, uh, a hippopotamus jumping a hedge. They're large animals, so they won't be able to do that. In the same way, I can't imagine how we could translate an autonomous social reality, genuinely autonomous, into the dimensions of the empire, uh, you know, whichever empire you're talking about, the UK, United States, Russia. In other words, the question of scale is crucial. When growth goes beyond a certain stage, a certain threshold, you see a change in the rules, the structures. Which, the, the, which regulate the processes between the various different parties involved. And there's always a cost involved there. Um, we heard of uh, counterproductivity. Economists talk about externalities. We could talk about social or environmental costs, reforms. I mean, there are an awful, there are however many of them, but the process is the same. I tried to sum up this process I'm talking about through this rather brutal graph which comes from Joseph Stender who uh, organized the complexity of society. I can give you a few examples if you like, but he was trying to put across the same idea that once you've gone beyond a certain scale, a certain threshold, what he called C1, a certain threshold in the growth process, uh, which necessarily involves a complexification process as well, because, um, well, Tenta talks about the, them being problem solving. So, you know, the continuous defacing new problems, new difficulties, differences in the, stru the, the structures start to diversify and become more complex. But once a certain threshold has been crossed, the yield, the benefits, in other words, which can be created by growth, become ever smaller until threshold C2, where they become negative. I could give you countless examples of this process. For example, an economic reality at the beginning, it uh, grows, there are uh, rising increments. In recently industrialized countries, as you can see, at the beginning there's a very rapid growth, rapid benefits. But once a certain threshold has been uh, passed, once the, econ the economy has become a big one, growth becomes much more difficult. The uh, European economies, for example, over the last 10 years on average, have grown less than 10% in 10 years, which means less than 1% per year. And that applies not only to the countries facing crisis in southern Europe, but also Germany, which is growing, has been growing at less than 1% per year over the last 10 years. That's purely on the economic level, of course, but uh, I am not only talking in economic terms. We could transfer this to the level of institutions, social structures. Illich was saying, just imagine Imagine. It's clear that uh, you've got a car, you can go faster, you can cover great distances, but there are a whole range of costs attached to the car, social and economic. And if we start to account for them, in other words, the amount of time that we spend 
buying the car, working on buying the car as well, the time it's taken to maintain the road network, the time we spend um, in traffic jams, in queues when we're driving, you know, that all has uh, a, a cost as well. And, you know, we're becoming down to less than 20 kilometers an hour. It might be easier to, to go on your bike, quite honestly, and more, you'd be more autonomous as well, because obviously this type of instrument is something over which we have total control, whereas, of course, we cannot control these mega cars, these major institutions, uh, which, you know, we could talk about being the major multinationals, the major bureaucratic uh, organizations, etc. I could give you a whole range of other examples, but I'll just touch on a couple to give you an idea of the, uh, the, the general uh, nature of this reasoning. On energy yield, for example, we've got quite a specific uh, uh, indicator here, the EROI, which talks about how much energy we get when we invest one unit of energy. In the golden years, at the beginning of the uh, century, around the 30s, um, fossil fuels rendered uh, about 100 units for each barrel of of oil used in uh, the uh, oil sector, the same, it will be 100 for the barrels of oil, and this index now has dropped. It dropped in the 70s to about 30, and right now we are at an even lower level, comparable with uh, those of certain renewable sources. We could say pretty much the same for gas as well, uh, and also for coal. So there's no doubt that the, uh, the um, for raw materials as well, not only energy, the uh, extraction industry is finding it more difficult to grow. It's always uh, more difficult to retain the same level of material from the same input. But even within our social systems as well, we can see the same sort of process. I could uh, give you an awful lot more, but this is the information on the uh, productivity of the health system in the United States. I mean, think about this carefully. At the beginning, investment in scientific research produces amazing results which can be easily extended across the board. For example, uh, research on penicillin costs a, a little less than $20,000 with the most amazing results. But as the system grows, the quantity of resources invested gradually increases, but the benefits which this type of system can provide, yes, they continue to grow, but at a lower rate. So the ratio, productivity, in other words, is ine inevitably reduced. Naturalmente, il problema di questo the problem with this key, of course, uh, that I'm trying to explain to you, which covers a long period, is that we have to try and understand if, as of a certain date, uh, and, and I think we can say that that date would be maybe in the mid-70s, the benefits that industrial growth was able to provide, whether they continued to increase as they did beforehand or not. Now, clearly, we have limits in research on this because we don't have data which could tell us in detailed fashion uh, for each country individually, whether, particularly not at a global level, um, you know, how these vary in terms of the benefits of growth. There are certain indicators, though, which can, I think, give us a um, rather general indication of this. This is the, uh, on this slide, the ESEN, the Index of Sustainable Economic Well-Being. And you'll see the uh, summary for six European economies compared with the GDP. 
for those same six countries. And as you can see, the two indicators grow together pretty much through until uh, the mid-70s when they become uncoupled and well, when be well-being continues to grow for a uh, small time, but not to the same extent. Um, but there's a slight drop in absolute values. So we still can't say certainly that the whole global economy has, uh, is in a situation of decreasing uh, um, yield, but it's highly plausible for the United States and particularly for the European countries. Uh, but even more than that, for the countries in Southern Europe, Italy, Portugal, Greece and Spain. Clearly, a further very important strategic index through which we can get an idea of the fact that uh, the costs of growth are continuously increasing. In other words, the benefits are decreasing, but the costs are rising. And that's largely due to um, public debt. Not only that, you see the total debt here domestic and uh, external debt in the United States. I don't think I need to say anything about this graph. But watch out, this doesn't only apply to the US economy. All of the main, the leading advanced economies over the last 30 years, you know, this isn't just a one-off, this is structural data. All of the leading World economies over the last 30 years have seen their debt increase. And this is happening for the first time in the history of capitalism. Obviously, the debt increased uh, quite markedly in times of warfare as well. But for this continuous growth, independent of the type of administration, left or right, uh, in support of the uh, minimum state rather than the welfare state, it's, it's never continued on a constant upward curve as it is now. So, there's some more deta detail here. I don't have the time to actually go into all of this now. I can leave the presentation so that you can uh, peruse it at leisure. Now, in a nutshell, the question we have to ask is whether this really is the way things stand if it's true that the so-called advanced economies, particularly the European economies, have moved into a situation of decreasing yield, decline in other words, but structural decline rather than uh, economic decline as uh, apparently our politicians would like us to believe. Uh, what scenarios can we expect to see? What uh, consequences can we establish from a political point of view in terms of vision, the overall vision? From our reading, I think basically we can establish four scenarios. Very briefly, number one, we could call the collapse scenario. Which doesn't mean that overnight the society is going to completely change. This collapse scenario could take several decades, as happened, for example, with the Roman Empire. And some European economies words apart, are in this situation. In other words, they are very rapidly losing their complexity and they are seeing their own institutions 
gradually um, fragmenting. Scenario two, I could call this the new expansion scenario. In theory, it's possible for a, uh, an economy to return to growth, as we've been told through the media by the uh, neoliberal economists and uh, neo-Keynesian -ki uh, economists as well, the Keynesian ones. And uh, as I say, this is new expansion, but that requires new energy. Georgesco talked about the, uh, the water in all of this. I don't know. Let me see if we've got time for this. Look at the uh, the oil peak here. It's clear that uh, in order to imagine having new expansion, we need uh, we need uh, access to new energy frontiers, and that's not something which uh, reasonably lies out there. Because, you know, within a few decades at the most, the, uh, we're probably going to hit the peak of overall energy production. We've hit the oil peak, but we've still got coal and oil. But when we hit the overall peak, obviously things will be very different. So I would rule out this type of scenario, at least from amongst the most probable ones. And obviously there are still then two basic alternatives. What we called the fortress here. In other words, the authoritarian solution. That's something which always has to be borne in mind. I don't have the time to go into the details of this now. Uh, Paul Annie described this very well in the Great Transition in the 30s. It's already happened. And I think you know something about this in Greece in terms of what it can uh, mean. It's always a possible solution because it means that you can simplify social reality and control resources. Obviously, this is not the solution we would like to see adopted. The last scenario, which I called resilience, is what we can um, call uh, serene uh, degrowth, as Latouche was saying. In other words, moving society towards voluntary simplification, decomplification within conditions which are genuinely compatible with the resources provided by the planet, and particularly which can tap into, exploit this uh, opportunity being offered to us by history to try and start moving along this path towards autonomy that Castoriadis wanted. This has already happened in history, this scenario. It comes back to what Marx called uh, motorway socialism, rather pejoratively. In other words, the idea we're talking about already has a past. They've already been uh, introduced in a not too different way to what we're thinking about, but history took a different turn. Maybe it was inevitable that this happened because we were at the very start of a major expansion phase. And obviously, I don't think you can imagine having a decentralized autonomous economy, an economy based on a network of local realities, as Butchki says, in times of exponential growth. That's not possible. But maybe it would be possible, thanks paradoxically to real degrowth. Thank you.